wasn't until I was 33 years old. I was grew up uh, as a photojournalist, um, working for Newsweek, Time, Business Week, Geo in Germany, Stern in Europe, um, and uh, did a piece on uh, for Black Star Photo Agency on trying to find new drugs in the rainforest. And that was my first step into the jungle, and it completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a National Geographic photographer since I was eight years old, but I was more interested in exotic cultures and people. Uh, but walking into the rainforest for the first time, I took <laughs> 10, 12 steps in, and my wife was behind me. I turned around and said, let's go back and meet the scientists we're going to work with. Because we were, we were totally ignorant of what the rainforest is like. But meeting and working with these deeply passionate scientists and seeing the jungle and the prolifer proliferation of life uh, from the top of the canopy to the bottom of the, the uh, soil, that was what was incredible. I mean, the life in the rainforest is just absolutely amazing. And I changed my life and started being a conservation photographer. Well, obviously, we hope we have some kind of influence, specifically with the readers of the magazine, and that the website is the number one website for animals around the world. We hope to further the discussion, specifically on this tiger story that's in the current issue of National Geographic magazine. It's not an easy story to look at. We all want to see pretty pictures of tigers, but the world doesn't need any more pretty pictures of tigers. We need to address the issues of their future. So the influence I hope I have is to give people a reason to care again about tigers and the next generation to understand that there is a project that can help them and that we need to band together as a world to be sure the world's largest cat. You know, I was in years ago um, <clears throat> uh, and but I've always believed that you can be a better wildlife photographer if you know how to cover the communities that live around them. Uh, there is no animal that is totally cut off from any human interaction. There are jungles in the world that are incredibly wild, um, but the vast majority of protected areas we have in the world are right next to communities of humanity. So we need to cover the, the whole story. What are these animals threatened by? Well, they're threatened by human activities, whether it's hunting, indoor poaching, uh, deforestation, uh, climate change, but in a smaller context that if we do stories, like I said, of pretty pictures of animals and cover their natural history, we're not telling the story. Uh, when I did Kazi Rong uh, on my last story, it was supposed to be a story about any park in the world park has an incredible amount of pressures, human pressures around it, the guards that risk their lives to protect the animals. You don't usually ever see that, but we have to see it so you can understand that there's these human encroachment coming in. There's a lot of livestock that are around that tigers may go out and eat them or other predators. Then they come into human-animal conflict with the people that are living there. That may make the people unhappy, though they enjoy living with wildlife, they say, but what are their day-to-day -day issues? Uh, we want to go on safari in Africa. We want people to live with predators, but those people need to benefit economically from living with predators. They only benefit negatively because the animal comes out, kills maybe their one buffalo that they get milk from, but they, they don't get anything for that. So. There has to be a value placed on wildlife. I 
must say that the only time you become very educated about any uh, federal system of wildlife protection is to spend a lot of time around it. So, and I haven't for years. The most time I've ever spent in your country has in, been in the Pantanal, in Mato Grosso Sur, in Mato Grosso, uh, in Cuyaba, and uh, I've gotten to know the people that work for the park system, Procarnivoros, um, and other wildlife organizations in your country trying to save the jaguar, and uh, or onça in Portuguese. <laughs> and, uh, hey, um, there's many issues, like with any predator. I mean, you have cattle production. Cowboys uh, don't like uh, on, in, uh, on the fazendas the fact that sometimes jaguars eat their cows. But the main issue there is, is that the percentage of uh, jaguars that actually eat cattle is uh, 1 or 2%. And when the most cattlemen come in and say, oh, a jaguar took 10% of my cows, no way does a jaguar kill that much. So it's all about understanding, working with scientists. I've talked to many um, owners of fazendas in Pantanal, and they say, this is a big thing. You have projects that come and go, um, and these guys never get the information that they need to be better ranchers. And now there are projects in the Pantanal that have long-term funding and that they can help everybody work together to m make more money on the fazenda and still have wildlife and not kill the onces or uh, the other wildlife that's there. I'm media director for Panthera, which is the world's largest big cat organization, and we work a lot with our Brazilian counterparts in, in the Pantanal trying to protect the onsa and the other wildlife. And I think the government people that we work with are incredible and are very dedicated and passionate about saving wildlife in Brazil. I'm still here, so I've been very lucky. Um, uh, the first time, uh, the most scared I ever was when I first started the job was in the Pantanal with a big onsa mm -hmm. who uh, was uh, I was way too close to but nothing happened we stopped at the last si second um, uh, so I was with Sergio Rivera and uh, he we both got too close to a jaguar but the most scared I've ever been was I was doing a story on tigers, elephants, and rhinos in India. And we were attacked five different times by rhinos, last time on an elephant. And the rhino attacked the elephant, bit the trunk. The elephant turns, and we were chased for like 300 meters to the edge of a forest. The gun fell out of the guard's hand when the elephant did a 180-degree turn and flew and they, the rhinos don't use their horn, they bite. They have huge teeth. And he was biting the elephant, and we were being chased. Uh, giant bears in Kamchatka, they charge you, but we have people with guns close to us. So I've been, and tigers, the same thing, but I've never been injured in the 20 years I've worked with National Geographic by an animal. Uh, the worst injuries... Uh, that come from microscopic animals, not the large predators. Worms, they're the worst. The number one thing, because I get many students that ask me questions, unfortunately so much of the time I'm out of the country and, and they never get an answer, but the answer to that question is is that we tell, we're, we're storytellers. So a lot of people concentrate on the one image. You need to concentrate on making many one great images that put together, make a story, and tell a story. When you asked me that I work with local people and I photograph the people that live with the animals, you can't tell the story of any species or any people that live with animals and may rely on the natural resources of an area 
or hunting without telling the whole story. You tell the story of the animal, you tell the story of the people that protect it, you tell the story of the people that live there that are affected negatively or positively by living with predators or other animals. So anybody that wants to do this, tell a story. You don't need to go halfway around the world to tell a story. You can tell a story in your neighborhood where you live. There may be someone that you just Eh, you always thought they were interesting. Could be your next door neighbor. Um, but if you can find a way to tell the story of that person or place or something, then that's how you become a great storyteller. And then you can come in to show your images to National Geographic. You have a great uh, edition of National Geographic in Brazil. And everybody wants to travel around the world because they think it's necessary. But their stories right next door to where you live and that's the easy way to do it best thing to do now you don't have to buy film so shoot make mistakes learn from those mistakes look at the masters of art look at the masters of photography but um, composition is very important in telling a story The number one thing, because I have many students that ask me questions, unfortunately so much of the time I'm out of the country and, and they never get an answer, but the answer to that question is, is that we tell, we're, we're storytellers. So a lot of people concentrate on the one image. You need to concentrate on making many one great images that put together make a story and tell a story. When you asked me that I work with local people and I photograph the people that live with the animals, well, you can't tell the story of any species or any people that live with animals and may rely on the natural resources of an area or hunting without telling the whole story. You tell the story of the animal, you tell the story of the people that protect it, you tell the story of the people that live there that are affected negatively or positively by living with predators or other animals. So anybody that wants to do this, tell a story. You don't need to go halfway around the world to tell a story. You can tell a story in your neighborhood where you live. There may be someone that you just Eh, you always thought they were interesting. Could be your next door neighbor. Um, but if you can find a way to tell the story of that person or place or something, then that's how you become a great storyteller. And then you can come in to show your images to National Geographic. You have a great uh, edition of National Geographic in Brazil. And everybody wants to travel around the world because they think it's necessary. But their stories right next door to where you live and that's the easy way to do it best thing to do now you don't have to buy film so shoot make mistakes learn from those mistakes look at the masters of art look at the masters of photography but um, composition is very important in telling a story well I think it's very important that we understand the importance of saving the big cats of the world and large predators because when you protect large landscapes like the Pantanal and you protect the Onsa, you're protecting everything underneath it. The Onsa is, in, is like an umbrella. He's there on top, but if you protect the land and the main predator, then you protect everything underneath it. And if we lose important large species like the onsa, it's like taking a piece of the body out, one of our organs. It won't work right. And we've seen that when the ecosystem breaks down, it affects everything in our world. That is the scientific example. But we need to have a moral example. Will we let these large cats disappear from our natural world and only see them in zoos? Shouldn't we have a moral or ethical reason for wanting the most beautiful creatures on the face of the earth 
to still walk free yeah. and not just in shoes. We have to ask ourselves a question. One, you can't take something out. You can't take your heart out or your lungs out or your liver out. So you can't take the onsa out of the ecosystem completely because it won't work properly. And do we have a moral and ethical reason in our lives to live in the natural world as it was given to us? Because we just all of a sudden were born by our mothers and we're here. And we look around and enter the rainforest and for the first time. And it's absolutely an incredible place that works naturally and we should keep it that way.